All right, guys, continuing on with Beloved, Beloved, Part 2, Chapter 1. 124 was loud. Stamp paid could hear it even from the road. He walked toward the house holding his head as high as possible so nobody looking could call him a sneak, although his worried mind made him feel like one. Ever since he showed that newspaper clipping to Paul D. and learned that he'd moved out of 124 that very day, Stamp felt uneasy. Having wrestled with the question of whether or not to tell a man about his woman, and having convinced himself that he should, he then began to worry about Sethi. Had he stopped the one shot he had of the happiness a good man could bring her? Was she vexed by the loss, the free and unasked for revival of gossip by the man? who had helped her cross the river and who was her friend as well as baby Suggs. I'm too old, he thought, for clear thinking. I'm too old and I've seen too much. He had insisted on privacy during the revelation at the slaughter yard. Now we wondered whom he was protecting. Paul D. was the only one in town who didn't know. How did information that had been in the newspaper become a secret that needed to be whispered in a pig yard? A secret from whom? Sethi, that's who. He'd gone behind her back like a sneak, but sneaking was his job, his life, though always for a clear and holy purpose. Before the war, all he did was sneak, runaways into hidden places, secret information to public places. Underneath his legal vegetables were the contraband humans that he ferried across the river. Even the pigs he worked in the spring served his purposes. Whole families lived on the bones and guts he distributed to them. He wrote their letters and read to them the ones they received. He knew who had dropsy and who needed stove wood, which children had a gift and which needed correction. He knew the secrets of the Ohio River and its banks, empty houses and full. The best dancers, the worst speakers, those with beautiful voices and those who could not carry a tune. There was nothing interesting between his legs. But he remembered when there had been when that drive drove the driven, and that was why he considered long and hard before opening his wooden box and searching for the 18-year-old clipping to show Paul D. as proof. Afterward, not before, he considered set these feelings in the matter, and it was the lateness of this consideration that made him feel so bad. Maybe he should have left it alone. Maybe Sethi would have gotten around telling him herself. Maybe he was not the high-minded soldier of Christ he thought he was, but an ordinary plain meddler, who had interrupted something going along just fine for the sake of truth and forewarning, things he set much store by. Now 124 was back like it was before Paul D. came to town, worrying Sethi in Denver with the pack of haunts he could hear from the road. Even if Sethi could deal with the return of the spirit, Stamp didn't believe her daughter could. Denver never, or Denver needed somebody normal in her life. By luck, he had been there at her very birth almost, before she knew she was alive. And it made him it made him partial to her. It was seeing her alive, don't you know, and looking healthy four weeks later that pleased him so much he gathered all he could carry of the best blackberries in the country and stuck two in her mouth first before he presented the difficult harvest to baby Suggs. To this day, he believed his berries, which sparked the feast and the wood chopping that followed, were the reason Denver was still alive. Had he not been there chopping firewood, Sethi would have spread her baby brains on the planking. Maybe he should have thought of Denver, if not Sethi, before he gave Paul D. the news that ran him off, the one normal somebody in the girl's life since baby Suggs died, and right there was the thorn. Deeper and more painful than his belated concern for Denver Sethi, scorching his soul like a silver dollar in a fool's pocket, was the memory of baby Suggs, the mountain to his sky. It was the memory of her and the honor that was her due that made him walk straight-necked into the yard of 124, although he heard its voices from the road. He had stepped foot in this house only once after the misery, which is what he called Sethi's rough response to the fugitive bill and that was to carry baby Suggs wholly out of it. When he picked her up in his arms, she looked at him like a girl, and he took the pleasure she would have knowing she didn't have to grind her hip bone anymore. That at last somebody carried her. Had she, had she waited just a little, she would have seen the end of the war, its short, flashy results. They could have celebrated together, gone to hear the great sermons preached on the occasion. 
As it was, he went alone from house to Joya's house, drinking what was offered. But she hadn't waited, and he attended her funeral more put out with her than bereaved. Sethi and her daughter were dry-eyed on that occasion. Sethi had no instructions except take her to the clearing, which he tried to do but was prevented by some rule the whites had invented about where the dead should rest. Baby Suggs went down next to the baby with its throat cut. A neighborliness that Stamp wasn't sure had Baby Suggs' approval. The setting up was held in the yard. <clears throat> Excuse me. The setting up was held in the yard because nobody besides himself would enter 124. An injury set the answered with another by refusing to attend the service. Reverend Pike presided over. She went instead to the gravesite whose silence she com whose silence she competed with as she stood there not joining in the hymns the others sang with all their hearts. That insult spawned another by the mourners. Back in the yard of 124, they ate the food they bought. They ate the food they brought and did not touch Sethi's, who did not touch theirs and forbade Denver to. So baby Suggs, holy, having devoted her freed life to harmony, was buried amid a regular dance of pride, fear, condemnation, and spite. Just about everybody in town was longing for Sethi to come on difficult times. Her outrageous claims, her self-sufficiency seemed to demand it. And Stamp Paid, who had not felt a trickle of meanness his whole adult life, wondered if some of the pride goeth before a fall. Expectations of the townsfolk had rubbed off on him anyhow, which would explain why he had not considered Sethi's feelings or Denver's needs when he showed Paul D. the clipping. He hadn't the vaguest notion of what he would do or say when and if Sethi opened the door and turned her eyes on his. He was willing to offer her help if she wanted any from him or receive her anger if she harbored any against him. Beyond that, he trusted his instincts to right what he may have done wrong to baby Suggs' kin and to guide him in and through the stepped-up haunting 124 was subject to, as evidenced by the voices he heard from the road. Other than that, he would rely on the power of Jesus Christ to deal with things older but not stronger than he himself was. What he heard as he moved toward the porch, he didn't, he didn't understand. Out on Bluestone Road, he thought he had heard a... Uh, out on Bluestone Road, he thought he heard a conflagration of hasty voices, loud, urgent, all speaking at once so he could not make out what they were talking about or to whom. The speech wasn't nonsensical exactly, nor was it tongues, but something was wrong with the order of the words and he couldn't describe or cipher it to save his life. All he could make out was the word mine. The rest of it stayed outside his mind's reach, yet he went on through. When he got to the steps, the voices drained suddenly to less than a whisper. It gave him pause. They had become an occasional mutter like the interior sounds a woman makes when she, believe, when she believes she's alone and unobserved at her work. A sith when she misses the needle's eye. A soft moan when she sees another chip in her one good platter. The low, friendly argument with which she greets the hands. Nothing fierce or startling, just that eternal private conversation that takes place between women and their tasks. Stamp paid raised his fist to knock on the door he had never knocked on because it was always open to or for him and could not do it. Dispensing with that formality was all the pay he expected from Negroes in his debt. Once Stamp paid brought you a coat, got the message to you, saved your life, or fixed the cistern, he took the liberty of walking in your door as though it were his own, since all his visits were beneficial his step or holler through a doorway got a bright welcome rather than forfeit the one privilege he claimed for himself he lowered his hand and left the porch over and over again he tried it made up his mind to visit Sethi, broke through the loud hasty voices to the mumbling beyond it and stopped trying to figure out what to do at the door six times in as many days he abandoned his normal route and tried to knock at 124 but the coldness of the gesture, its sign that he was indeed a stranger at the gate, overwhelmed him. Retracing the steps in the snow, he sighed, spirit willing, flesh weak. While Stamp Pay was making up his mind to visit 124 for baby Suggs' sake, Sethi was trying to take her advice to lay it all down, sword and shield, not just to acknowledge the advice baby Suggs gave her, but actually to take it. Four days after Paul D. reminded her of how many feet she had, Sethi rummaged among the shoes of strangers to find the ice skates she was sure were there. Digging in the, 
Digging in the heap, she despised herself for having been so trusting, so quick to surrender at the stove while Paul D. kissed her back. She should have known that he would behave like everybody else in town once he knew. The 28 days of having women friends, a mother-in-law, and all her children together, of being part of a neighborhood, of in fact having neighbors at all to call her own, all that was long gone and would never come back. No more dancing in the clearing or happy feeds, no more discussions, stormy or quiet, about the true meaning of the fugitive bill, the settlement fee, God's ways and Negro pews, anti-slavery, manumission, skin voting, Republicans, Dred Scott, book learning, sojourners, high-wheeled buggy, the colored ladies of Delaware, Ohio, and the other weighty issues that held them in chairs, scraping the floorboards or pacing them in agony or exhilaration. No anxious wait for the North Star or news of a beat-off. No sighing, no sighing at a new betrayal or hand-clapping at a small victory. Those 28 happy days were followed by 18 years of disapproval in a solitary life. Then a few months of the sun-splashed life that the shadows holding hands on the road promised her. Tentative greetings from other colored people and Paul D's company. A bed life for herself except for Denver's friend. Every bit of it had disappeared. Was that the pattern, she wondered, every 18 or 20 years her unlivable life would be interrupted by a short-lived glory? Well, if that's the way it was, that's the way it was. She had been on her knees scrubbing the floor, Denver trailing her with the drying rags when Beloved appeared, saying, What these do? On her knees, scrub, brush, in hand, she looked at the girl on the skates she held up. Seth, he couldn't skate a lick, but then and there she decided to take baby Suggs' advice. Lay it all down. She left the bucket where it was, told Denver to get out the shawls and started searching for the other skates she was certain were in that heap somewhere. Anybody feeling sorry for her, anybody wandering by to peep in and see how she was getting on, including Paul D, would discover that the woman junk heaped for the third time because she loved her children. That woman was sailing happily on a frozen creek. Hurriedly, carelessly, she threw the shoes about. She found one blade, a man's. Well, she said, we'll take turns, two skates on one, one skate on one, and shoe slide for the other. Nobody saw them falling. Holding hands, bracing each other, they swirled over the ice. Beloved wore the pair, Denver wore one, step gliding over the treacherous ice. Sethi thought her two shoes would hold and anchor her. She was wrong. Two paces onto the creek, she lost her balance and landed on her behind. The girl, screaming with laughter, joined her on the ice. Sethi struggled to stand and discover not only that she could do a split, but that it hurt. Her bones surfaced in unexpected places, and so did laughter, making a circle or a line. The three of them could not stay upright for one whole minute, but nobody saw them falling. Each seemed to be helping the other two stay upright, yet every tumble doubled their delight. The live oak and sewing pine on the banks enclosed them and absorbed their laughter while they fought gravity for each other's hands. Their skirts flew like wings and their skin turned pewter in the cold and dying light. Nobody saw them falling. Exhausted, finally they lay down on their backs to recover breath. The sky above them was another country. Winter stars, close enough to lick, had come out before sunset. Before a moment looking up, Sethi entered the perfect peace they offered. Then Denver stood up and tried for a long, independent glide. The tip of her single skate hit an ice bump, and as she fell, the flapping of her arms was so wild and hopeless that all three, Sethi, Beloved, and Denver herself, laughed till they coughed. Sethi rose to her hands and knees, laughter still shaking her chest, making her eyes wet. She stayed that way for a while on all fours, but when her laughter died, the tears did not, and it was some time before Beloved or Denver knew the difference. When they did, they touched her lightly on the shoulders. Walking back through the woods, Sethi put an arm around each other. Walking back through the woods, Sethi put an arm around each girl at her side. Both of them had an arm around her waist. Making their way over hard snow, they stumbled and had to hold on tight, but nobody saw them fall. Inside the house, they found out they were cold. They took off their shoes, wet stockings, and put on dry woolen ones. Denver fed the fire, Sethi warmed a pan of milk and stirred cane syrup and vanilla into it. Wrapped in quilts and blankets before the cooking stove, they drank, wiped their noses, and drank again. We could roast some taters, said Denver. Tomorrow, said Sethi, time to sleep. She poured them each a bit more of the hot, sweet milk. The stove fire roared. You finished with your eyes, asked Beloved. Sethi smiled. Yes, I'm finished with my eyes. Drink up. Time for bed. But none of them wanted to leave the warmth of the blankets, the fire, and the cups for the chill of an unheated bed. They went on sipping and watching the fire. When the click came, Sethi didn't know what it was. Afterward, it was clear as daylight that the click came at the very beginning. 
a beat almost before it started, before she heard three notes, before the melody was even clear. Leaning forward a little, Beloved was humming softly. It was then when Beloved finished humming that Seti recalled the click, the settling of pieces into places designed and made especially for them. No milk spilled from her cup because her hand was not shaking. She simply turned her head and looked at Beloved's profile. The chin, mouth, nose, forehead copied and exaggerated in the huge shadow the fire threw on the wall behind her. Her hair, which Denver had braided into 20 or 30 plates, curved toward her shoulders like arms. From where she sat, Sethi could not examine it, not the hairline, nor the eyebrows, the lips, nor. All I remember, baby Suggs had said, is how she loved the burnt bottom of bread. Her little hands, I wouldn't know them if they slapped me. The birthmark, nor the color of the gums, the shape of her ears, nor. Here, look here, this is your man. If you can't tell me by my face, look here. The fingers, nor their nails, nor even. But there would be time. The click had clicked. Things were where they ought to be, or poised and ready to glide in. I made that song up, said Sethi. I made it up and sang it to my children. Nobody knows that song but me and my children. Beloved turned to look at Sethi. I know it, she said. A hobnail casket of jewels found in a tree hollow should be fondled before it is open. Its lock may have rusted or broken away from the clasps. Still, you should touch the nail heads and test its weight. No smashing with an axe, head before it is decently exhumed from the grave that has hidden it all this time. No gasp at a miracle that is truly miraculous, because the magic lies in the fact that you knew it was there for you all along. Sethi wiped the white satin coat from the inside of the pan, brought pillows from the keeping room for the girls' head. For the girls' heads, there was no tremor in her voice as she instructed them to keep the fire, if not, come on upstairs. With that, she gathered her blanket around her elbows and ascended the lily-white stairs like a bride. Outside, snow solidified itself into graceful forms. The piece of winter stars seemed permanent. Fingering a ribbon and smelling skin, Stamp Pate approached 124 again. My marrow is tired, he thought. I've been tired all my days, bone tired, but now it's in the marrow. Must be what baby Suggs felt when she lay down and thought about color for the rest of her life. When she told him what her, her aim was, he thought she was ashamed and too ashamed. He thought she was ashamed and too ashamed to say so. Her authority in the pulpit, her dance in the clearing, her powerful call. She didn't deliver sermons or preach, insisting she was too ignorant for that. She called and the hearing heard. All that had been mocked and rebuked by the blood spill in her backyard, God puzzled her and she was too ashamed of him to say so. Instead, she stole, instead she told Stamp she was going to bed to think about the colors of things. He tried to dissuade her. Sethi was in jail with her nursing baby, the one he had saved. Her sons were holding hands in the yard, terrified of letting go. Strangers and familiars were stopping by to hear how it went one more time and suddenly baby declared peace. She just up and quit. By the time Sethi was released, she had exhausted blue and was well on her way to yellow. At first, he would see her in the yard occasionally or delivering food to the jail or shoes in town. Then less and less. He believed then that shame put her in the bed. Now, eight years after her contentious funeral and 18 years after the misery, he changed his mind. Her marrow was tired and it was a testimony to the heart that fed it that it took eight years to meet finally the color she was hankering after. The onslaught of her fatigue like his was sudden but lasted for years. After 60 years of losing children to the people who chewed up her life and spit it out like a fishbone. After five years of freedom given to her by her last child who bought her future with his, exchanged it so to speak so she could have one whether he did or not. To lose him too, to acquire a daughter and grandchildren and see that daughter slay the children or try to. To belong to a community of other free Negroes, to love and be loved by them, to counsel and be counseled, protect and be protected, feed and be fed, and then to have that community step back and hold itself at a distance, well, it could wear out even a baby Suggs, holy. Listen here, girl, he told her. You can't quit the word. It's given to you to speak. You can't quit the word. I don't care what all happened to you. They were standing in Richmond Street, ankle deep in leaves. Lamps lit the downstairs windows of spacious houses and made the early evening look darker than, than it was. The odor of burning leaves was brilliant, quite by chance, as he pocketed a penny tip for a delivery. He had glanced across the street and recognized the skipping woman as his old friend. 
He had not seen her in weeks, quickly he crossed the street, scuffing red leaves as he went. When he stopped her with a greeting, she returned it with a face not clean of interest. She could have been she could have been a plate, a carpet bag full of shoes in her hand. She waited for him to begin, lead or share a conversation. Lead or share a conversation. If there had been sadness in her eyes, he would have understood it, but indifference lodged where sadness should have been. You missed the clearing three Saturdays running, he told her. She turned her head away and scanned the houses along the street. Folks came, he said. Folks come, folks go, she answered. Here, let me carry that. He tried to take her bag from her, but she wouldn't let him. I got a, I got a delivery someplace long in here, she said, name of Tucker. Yonder, he said, twin chestnuts in the yard, sick too. They walked a bit, his pace slow to accommodate her skip. Well, well what? Saturday coming, you going to call or what? If I call them and they come, what on earth I'm going to say? Say the word. He checked his shout too late. Two white men, burning leaves, turned their heads in his direction. Bending low, he whispered into her ear. The word. The word. That's one other thing took away from me, she said, and that was when he exhorted her. Pleaded with her not to quit, no matter what. The word had been given to her, and she had to speak it. Had to. They had reached the twin chestnuts in the white house that stood behind them. See what I mean, he said, big trees like that. Both of them together ain't got the leaves of a young birch. I see what you mean, she said, but she peered instead at the white house. You gotta do it, he said, you got to. Can't nobody call like you, you have to be there. What I have to do is get in my bed and lay down. I want to fix on something harmless in this world. What world are you talking about? Ain't nothing harmless down here. Yes, it is, blue. That don't hurt nobody, yellow neither. You getting in the bed to think about yellow? I likes yellow. Then what? When you get through with blue and yellow, then what? Can't say. If something can't be planned. It's something can't be planned. You blaming God, he said. That's what you're doing. No, Stamp, I ain't. You saying the white folks won? That what you saying? I'm saying they came in my yard. You saying nothing counts. I'm saying they came in my yard. Sethi's the one did it. And if she hadn't, you saying God give up? Nothing left for us but pour out our own blood? I'm saying they came in my yard. You punishing him, ain't you? Not like he punished me. You can't do that, baby. It ain't right. Was the time I knew what was the time I knew what that was. You still know. What I know is what I see. A nigger woman hauling shoes. Aw, oh, baby. He licked his lips, searching with his tongue for the words that will turn her around, lighten her load. We have to be steady. These things too will pass. What are you looking for? A miracle? No, she said. I'm looking for what I was put here to look for. The back door. And skipped right to it. They didn't let her in. They took the shoes from her as she stood on the steps and she rested her hip on the railing while the white woman went looking for the dime. Stamp paid, rearranged his way, too angry to walk her home and listen to more. He watched her for a moment and turned to go before the alert white face at the window next door had come to any conclusion. Trying to get to 124 for the second time now, he regretted that conversation. The high tone he took, his refusal to see the effect of moral, the refusal to see the effect of marrow weariness in a woman he believed was a mountain. Now too late he understood her. The heart that pumped out love, the mouth that spoke the word, didn't count. They came in her yard anyway, and she could not approve or condemn Sethi's rough choice. One or the other might have saved her, but beaten up by the claims of both, she went to bed. The white folks had tired her out at last. And him, 1874, and white folks were still on the loose. Whole towns wiped clean of Negroes, 87 lynchings in one year alone in Kentucky. Four colored schools burned to the ground, grown men whipped like children, children whipped like adults, black women raped by the crew, property taken, necks broken. He smelled skin, skin and hot blood. The skin was one thing, but human blood cooked in a lynch fire was a whole other thing. The stench stank, stank up off the pages of the North Star, out of the mouths of witnesses etched in crooked handwriting and letters delivered by hand. Detailed in documents and petitions full of whereas and presented to any legal body who'd read it, it stank. But none of that had worn out his marrow. None of that. It was the ribbon, tying his flatbed up on the bank of the Licking River, securing it the best he could. He caught sight of something red on its bottom. Reaching for it, he thought it was a cardinal feather stuck to his boot. He tugged and what came loose in his hand was a red ribbon knotted around a curl of wet woolly hair, clinging still to its bit of scalp. He untied the ribbon and put it in his pocket, dropped the curl in the weeds. On the way home he stopped, short of breath and dizzy, he waited until the spell passed before continuing on his way. 
A moment later, his breath left him again. This time, he sat down by a fence. Rested, he got to his feet, but before he took a step, he turned to look back down the road. He was traveling, and said, to its frozen mud and, and the river beyond. What are these people? You tell me, Jesus. What are they? When he got to his house, he was too tired to eat the food his sister and nephews had prepared. He sat on the porch in the cold till way past dark and went to his bed only because his sister's voice calling him was getting nervous. He kept the ribbon, the skin smell nagged him, and his weakened marrow made him dwell on baby Suggs' wish to consider what in the world was harmless. He hoped she stuck to blue, yellow, maybe green, and never fixed on red. Mistaking her, upbraiding her, owing her, now he needed to let her know he knew and to get right with her and her kin. So in spite of his exhausted marrow, he kept on through the voices and tried once more to knock at the door of 124. This time, although he couldn't cipher but one word, he believed he knew who spoke them. The people of the broken necks of fire-cooked blood and black girls who had lost their ribbons. What a roaring. Sethi had gone to bed smiling, eager to lie down and unravel the proof for the conclusion she had already leaped to. Fondle the day and circumstances of Beloved's arrival and the meaning of that kiss in the clearing. She slept instead and woke, still smiling, to a snow-bright morning. Cold enough to see her breath, she lingered a moment to collect the courage to throw off the blankets and hit a chilly floor. For the first time, she was going to be late for work. Downstairs, she saw the girls sleeping where she left them, but back to back now, each wrapped tight in blankets breathing into their pillows. The pair and a half of skates were lying by the front door. The stockings hung on a nail behind the cooking stove to dry. Had not. Sethi looked at Beloved's face and smiled. Quietly, carefully, she stepped around her to wake the fire. First a bit of paper, then a little kindling, not too much, just a taste until it was strong enough for more. She fed its dance until it was wild and fast. When she went outside to collect more wood from the shed, she did not notice the man's frozen footprints. She crunched around to the back to the cord piled high with snow. After scraping it clean, she filled her arms with as much dry wood as she could. She even looked straight at the shed, smiling, smiling at the things she would not have to remember now, thinking she ain't even mad with me, not a bit. Talking about Beloved. Obviously, the hand-holding shadows she had seen on the road were not Paul D., Denver, and herself, but us three. The three holding on to each other, skating the night before, the three sipping flavored milk. And since that was so, if her daughter could come back home from the time this place, certainly her sons could and would come back from wherever they had gone to. Sethi covered her front teeth with her tongue against the cold, hunched forward by the burden in her arms. She walked back around the house to the porch, not once noticing the frozen track she stepped in. Inside, the girls were still sleeping, although they had changed positions while she was gone, both drawn to the fire. Dumping the arm load into the wood box made them stir, but not wake. Sethi started the cooking stove as quietly as she could, reluctant to wake the sisters, happy to have them asleep at her feet while she made breakfast. Too bad she would be late for work, too. Too bad. Once in 16 years, that's just too bad. She had beaten two eggs into yesterday's hominy, formed it into patties, and fried them with some ham pieces before Denver woke completely and groaned. Back stiff? Oh yeah, sleeping on the floor is supposed to be good for you. Hurts like the devil, said Denver. Said Denver. Could be that fall you took, Denver smiled. That was fun. She turned to look down at Beloved, snoring lightly. Should I wake her? No, let her rest. She likes to see you off in the morning. I'll make sure she does, said Sethi and thought. Be nice to think first before I talk to her. Let her know I know. Think about all I ain't got to remember no more. Do like Baby said. Think on it and lay it down for good. Paul D. convinced me there was a world out there and that I could live in it. Should have known better. Didn't know better. Whatever is going on outside my door ain't for me. The world is in this room. This here's all there is and all there needs to be. They ate like men, ravenous and intent, saying little, content with the company of the other and the opportunity to look in her eyes. When Sethi wrapped her head and bundled up to, when Sethi wrapped her head and bundled up to go to town, it was already mid morning. And when she left the house, she neither saw the prince nor heard the voices that ringed 124 like a noose. Trudging in the ruts left earlier by wheels, Sethi was excited to giddiness by the things she no longer had to remember. I don't have to remember nothing. I don't even have to explain. She understands it all. I can forget how baby Suggs' heart collapsed, how we agreed it was consumption without a sign of it in the world. Her eyes when she brought my food, I can forget that, and how she told me that Howard and Bugler were all right but wouldn't let go each other's hands. Played that way, stayed that way, especially in their sleep. 
She handed me the food from a basket, things wrapped small enough to get through the bars, whispering news. Mr. Bodwin going to see the judge in chambers, she kept on saying, in chambers, like I knew what it meant or she did. The colored ladies of Delaware, Ohio, had drawn up a petition to keep me from being hanged. That two, that two white preachers had come round and wanted to talk to me, pray for me. That a newspaper man came too. She told me the news and I told her I needed something for the rats. She wanted Denver out and slapped her palms when I wouldn't let her go. Wear your earrings, she said. I'll hold them for you. I told her the jailer took them to protect me from myself. He thought I could do some harm with the wire. Baby Suggs covered her mouth with her hand. School teacher left town, she said, filed a claim and rode on off. They going to let you out for they going to let you out for the burial, she said. Not the funeral, just the burial. And they did. The sheriff came with me and looked away when I fed Denver in the wagon. Neither Howard nor Bugler would let me near them, not even to touch their hair. I believe a lot of folks were there, but I just saw the box. Reverend Pike spoke in a real loud voice, but I didn't catch a word except the first two. And three months later, when Denver was ready for solid food and they let me out for good, I went and got you a gravestone. But I didn't have money enough for the carving, so I exchanged bartered, you might say, what I did have. And I'm sorry to this day I never thought to ask him for the whole thing. All I heard of what Reverend Pike said. Dearly beloved, which is what you are to me. And I don't have to be sorry about getting only one word. And I don't have to remember the slaughterhouse and the Saturday girls who worked its yard. I can forget that what I did changed baby Suggs' life. No clearing, no company, just laundry and shoes. I can forget it all now because as soon as I got the gravestone in place, you made your presence known in the house and worried us all to distraction. I didn't understand it then. I thought you were mad with me. And now I know that, it, that if you was, you ain't now because you came back here to me and I was right all along. There is no world outside my door. I only need to know one thing. How bad is the scar? I said they walked to work late for the first time in 16 years and wrapped in a time this present. Stamp paid, fought fatigue in the habit of a lifetime. Baby Suggs refused to go to the clearing because she believed they had won. He refused to acknowledge any such victory. Baby had no back door, so he braved the cold and a wall of talk to knock on the one she did have. He clutched the red ribbon in his pocket for strength, softly at first and harder. At the last, he banged furiously, disbelieving it could happen, that the, that the door of a house with colored people in it did not fly open in his presence. He went to the window and wanted to cry. Sure enough, there they were, not a one of them heading for the door, wearing his scrap of ribbon to shreds. Worrying his scrap of ribbon to shreds, the old man turned and went down the steps. Now curiosity joined his shame and his debt. Two backs curled away from him as he looked in the window. One had a head he recognized, the other troubled him. He didn't know her, didn't know anybody it could be. Nobody, but nobody visited that house. After a disagreeable breakfast, he went to see Ella and John to find out what they knew. Perhaps there he could find out if, after all these years of clarity, he had misnamed himself and there was yet another debt he owed. Born Joshua, he renamed himself when he handed over his wife to his master's son. Handed her over in the sense that he did not kill anybody there by himself because his wife demanded he stay alive. Otherwise, she reasoned, where and to whom could she return when the boy was through? With that gift, he decided that he didn't owe anybody anything. Whatever his obligations were, that act paid them off. He thought it would make himself rambunctious, renegade, a drunkard even the debtlessness, and in a way it did, but there was nothing to do with it. Work well, work well, work poorly, work a little, work not at all, make sense, make none, sleep, wake up, like somebody, dislike others. It didn't seem much of a way to live and it brought him no satisfaction, so he extended this debtlessness to other people by helping them pay out and off whatever they owed in misery. Beaten runaways, he ferried them and rendered them paid for, gave them their own bill of sale, so to speak. You paid it now, now life owes you. And the receipt, as it were, was a welcome door that he never had a knock on, like John and Ella's in front of which he stood and said, Who in there? Only once, and she was pulling on the hinge. Where well, you been keeping yourself? I told John, must be cold, a stamp stay inside. Oh, I been out, he took off his cap and massaged his scalp. Out where? Not by here, Ella hung two suits of underwear on a line behind the stove. Was over to baby Suggs's this morning. What you want in there, asked Ella. Somebody invite you in? That's baby's kin. I don't need no invite to look after her people. Sith. Ella was unmoved. She had been baby Suggs' friend and set these two to the rough time. Except for a nod at the carnival, she hadn't given Sethi the time of day. 
Somebody new in there, a woman. Thought you might know who she is. Thought, thought you might know who who is she. Ain't no new Negroes in this town I don't know about, she said. What's she look like? You sure that wasn't Denver? I know Denver. This girl's narrow. You sure? I know what I see. Might see anything at all at 124. True. Better ask Paul D, she said. Can't locate him, said Stamp, which was the truth, although his efforts to find Paul D had been feeble. He wasn't ready to comfort the man whose life he had altered with his graveyard information. He's sleeping in the church, said Ella. The church, Stamp was shocked and very hurt. Yeah, asked Reverend Pike if he could stay in the cellar. Yeah, asked Reverend Pike if he could stay in the cellar. It's cold as charity in there. I expect he knows that. What'd he do that for? He's a touch proud, seemed like. He don't have to do that. Any number will take him in. I'll have to turn around to look at Stamp Paid. Can nobody read minds long distance? All he have to do is ask somebody. Why? Why he have to ask? Can nobody offer? What's going on? Since when a black man come to town have to sleep in a cellar like a dog? Unrile yourself, Stamp. Not me. I'm going to stay riled till somebody gets some sense and least, and least way act like a Christian. It's only a few days he's been there. Shouldn't be no days. You know all about it. And don't give him a hand? That don't sound like you, Ella. Me and you have been pulling color folk out the waters more than 20 years. Now you tell me you can't offer a man a bed, a working man too, a man what can pay his own way? He asks, I give him anything. Why is that necessary all of a sudden? I don't know him all that well. You know he's colored. Stamp, don't tear me up this morning. I don't feel like it. It's her, ain't it? Her who? Sethi. He took up with her and stayed in there and you don't want nothing to... Hold on, don't jump if you can't see bottom. Girl, give it up. We've been friends too long to act like this. Well, who can tell what all went on in there? Look here, I don't know who said the is or none of her people. What? All I know is she married baby Suggs, boy, and I ain't sure I know I know that. Where is he, huh? Baby never laid eyes on her till John carried her to the door with the baby I strapped on her chest. I strapped that baby. And you way off the track with that wagon. Her children know who she was, even if you don't. So what? I ain't saying she wasn't their mammy, but who's to say... They was baby Suggs' grandchildren. How she get on board and her husband didn't. And tell me this, how she have that baby in the woods by herself, said a white woman come out the trees and helped her shoot. You believe that, a white woman? Well, I know what kind of white that was. Aw, oh, no, Ella. Anything white floating around in the woods, if it ain't got a shotgun, is something I don't want no part of. Y'all was friends. Yeah, till she showed herself. Ella, I ain't got no friends. Take a handsaw to their own children. You in deep water, girl. Uh-huh. I'm on the dry land and I'm going to stay there. You the one wet. What's any of what you talking about got to do with Paul D? What run him off? Tell me that. I run him off. You? I told him about. I showed him the newspaper about the what Seth he did. Re read it to him. He left that very day. He didn't tell me that. I thought he knew. He didn't know nothing except her from when they was at that place Baby Suggs was at. He knew Baby Suggs? Sure he knew her. Her boy Hale too. And left when he found out what Seth he did? Look like you might have a place to stay after all. What you say casts a different light, I thought. But Stan Pay knew what she thought. You didn't come here asking about him, Alice said. You came about some new girl. That's so. Well, Paul D must know who she is or what she is. Your mind is loaded with spirits everywhere you look, you see one. You know as well as I do that people who die bad don't stay on the ground. He couldn't deny it. Jesus Christ himself didn't. So Stamp ate a piece of Alice's head cheese to show there were no bad feelings and set out to find Paul D. He found him on the steps of Holy Redeemer, holding his wrist between his knees and looking red-eyed. Get a glass of water real quick. So said they found out who Baby um, Sethi found out who Beloved was. His Beloved started humming a song that only Sethi knew. She realized that's her daughter. They went ice skating, had a good time, made breakfast. Sethi didn't care about showing up to work late. You know, the next morning after a, a beautiful night, realizing, you know, she was amongst her daughter who pretty much came home, you know. And um, now she has hope maybe her, her boys will come back. And, um... Stamp paid, you know, he keeps showing up, but he's too reluctant. He's too scared and nervous and feels ashamed about pretty much ruining the relationship that Sethi had with Paul D, letting Paul D know about that situation, about, her, you know, the white man showed up to take Sethi back, you know, because she was a runaway slave. And Sethi got so scared and 
pretty much said, I'm going to just kill myself and my kids before I let the white man take me back. I don't know, Paul D. left. He couldn't handle it. He thought Sethi was crazy. And even the whole town kind of turned on her. And, and after that incident, it wasn't the same. And um, you, you see the conversation that Stan Paid had with the old friends of Baby Suggs, who is Hale, who is the father of these children, who something must have happened to him. But that's Baby Suggs' son. And Sethi is her daughter-in-law so let's continue on Stamp Paid knows where Paul D is staying at I guess he's staying at the church so they are having a little conversation here so Sawyer shouted at her when she entered the kitchen actually this is a Sethi showing up late to work Sawyer shouted at her when she entered the kitchen, but she just turned her back and reached for her apron. There was no entry now, no crack or crevice available. She had taken pains to keep them out, but knew full well that at any moment they could rock her, rip her from her moorings, send the birds twittering back into her hair, drain her mother's milk they had already done, divided her back into plant life, that too, driven her fat belly into the woods they had done that, all news of them was rot. They buttered Hale's face, gave Paul D. iron to eat, crisped, crisped six so hanged her own mother. She didn't want any more news about white folks, didn't want to know what Alan knew and John and Stamp paid about the world done up the way white folks loved it. All news of them should have stopped with the birds in her hair. Once long ago she was soft, trusting. She trusted Mrs. Garner and her husband too. She knotted the earrings into her underskirt to take a long, not so much to wear but to hold, earrings that made her believe she could discriminate among them. That for every school teacher there would be an Amy. That for every pupil there was a Garner, or Bodwin, or even a sheriff whose touch at her elbow was gentle and who looked away when she nursed. But she had come to believe every one of Baby Suggs' last words and buried all recollection of them in, of them in luck. Paul D. dug it up, gave her back her body, kissed her divided back, stirred her memory, and brought her more news of clabber, of iron, of roosters smiling, but when he heard her news, he counted her feet and didn't even say goodbye. Don't talk to me, Mr. Sawyer. Don't say nothing to me this morning. What? 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 You talking back to me? I'm telling you, don't say nothing to me. You better get them pies made. Sethi touched the fruit and picked up the paring knife. When pie juice hit the bottom of the oven and hissed, Sethi was well into the potato salad. Sawyer came in and said, not too sweet. You make it too sweet. They don't need it. Make it the way I always did. Yeah, too sweet. None of the sausages came back. The cook had a way with them and Sawyer's restaurant never had leftover sausage. If Sethi wanted any, she put them aside soon as they were ready, but there was some passable stew. Problem was all her pies were sold too, only rice pudding left and half a pan of gingerbread that didn't come out right. Had she been paying attention instead of daydreaming all morning, she wouldn't be picking around looking for her dinner like a crab. She couldn't read clock time very well, but she knew when the hands were closed in prayer at the top of the face she was through for the day. She got a metal top jar, filled it with stew, and wrapped the gingerbread in butcher paper. These she dropped in her outer skirt pockets and began washing up. None of it was anything like what the cook and the two waitresses walked off with, or the two waiters walked off with. Mr. Sawyer included midday dinner in the terms of the job, along with $3.40 or three dollars and forty cents a week, and she made him understand from the beginning she would take her dinner home. But matches, sometimes a bit of kerosene, a little salt, butter too, these things she took also once in a while and felt ashamed because she could afford to buy them. She just didn't want the embarrassment of waiting out back of Phelps store with the others till every white in Ohio was served before the keeper turned to the cluster of negro faces looking through a hole in his back door. She was ashamed too because it was stealing and Sixo's argument on the subject amused her but didn't change the way she felt just as it didn't change school teacher's mind. Did you steal that shoat? You stole that shoat, school teacher was quiet but firm like he was just going through the motions not expecting an answer that mattered. Sixo sat there not even getting up to plead or deny. He just sat there, the streak of lean, the streak of lean in his hand, the gristle clustered in the tin plate like gemstones, rough, unpolished, but loot nevertheless. You stole that shoat, didn't you? No, sir, said Sixo, but he had the decency to keep his eyes on the meat. You telling me you didn't steal it and I'm looking right at you? 
No, sir, I didn't steal it. School teacher smiled. Did you kill it? Yes, sir, I killed it. Did you butcher it? Yes, sir. Did you cook it? Yes, sir. Well, then, did you eat it? Yes, sir, I sure did. Ain't telling me that's not stealing? No, sir, it ain't. What is it then? Improving your property, sir. What? Six o plant rye to give the high piece a better chance. Six o take and feed the soil, give you more crops. Six o take and feed. Six o give you more work. Clever, but school teacher beat him anyway to show him that definitions belong to the definers, not the defined. After Mr. Garner died with a hole in his ear that Mrs. Garner said was an exploded eardrum brought on by stroke, and six o said with gunpowder. Everything they touched was looked on as stealing. Not just a rifle of corn or two yard eggs the hen herself didn't even remember. Everything. School teacher took away the guns from the sweet home men and deprived of game to round out their diet of bread, beans, hominy, vegetables, and a little extra at slaughter time. They began to pilfer in earnest and it became not only their right but their obligation. Said they understood it then but now with a paying job and an employer who was kind enough to hire an ex-convict, she despised herself for the pride that made pilfering better than standing in line at the window of the general store with all the other negroes she didn't want to jostle them or be jostled by them feel their judgment or their pity especially now she touched the forehead with the back of her wrist and blotted the perspiration the work they had come to a close and already she was feeling the excitement not since that other escape she had felt so alive slopping the alley dogs watching their frenzy she pressed her lips today would be a day she would accept the lift if anybody on a wagon offered it no one would, and for sixteen years her pride had not let her ask, but today, oh today, now she wanted speed to skip over the long walk home and be there. When Sawyer warned her, excuse me, when Sawyer warned her about being late again, she barely heard him. She used to be a, he used to be a sweet man, patient, tender in his dealings with his help, but each year following the death of his son and the war, he grew more and more crotchety, as though Sethi's dark face was to blame. Unhuh, she said, wondering how she could hurry time along and get to the no time waiting for her. She needn't have worried, wrapped tight, hunched forward as she started home. Her mind was busy with the things she could forget. Thank God I don't have to, thank God I don't have to remember you or say a thing because you know it all. You know I never would have left you, never. It was all I could think of to do. When the train came, I had to be ready. School teacher was teaching us things we couldn't learn. I didn't care nothing about the measuring string. We all laughed about that except Sixo. He didn't laugh at nothing, but I didn't care. School teacher would wrap that string all over my head, cross my nose around my behind, number my teeth. I thought he was a fool, and the questions he asked was the biggest foolishness of all. Then me and your brothers come up from the second patch. The first one was close to the house where the quick things grew beans onions sweet peas the other one was further down for long-lasting things potatoes pumpkin okra pork salad not much was up not much was up yet down there it was early still some young salad maybe but that was all we pulled weeds and hoed a little to give everything a good start after that we hid out for the house the ground raised up from the second patch not a hill exactly but kind of enough for bugler and howard to run up and roll down run up and roll down that's the way i used to see them in my dreams laughing their short fat legs running up the hill now all i see is their backs walking down the railroad tracks away from me always away from me but that day they was happy running up and rolling down it was early still the growing season had took hold but not much was up i remember the peas still had flowers the grass was long though full of white buds and those tall red blossoms people called diane and something there with the leastest little bit of blue light like a cornflower but pale pale real pale i maybe should have hurried because i left you back at the house in a basket in the yard away from where the chickens scratched but you never know anyway i took my time getting back but your brothers didn't have patience with me staring at flowers and sky every two or three steps they ran on ahead and i let them something sweet lives in the air that time of the year and if the breeze is right it's hard to stay indoors when i got back i could hear howard and bugler laughing down the quarters laughing down by the quarters i put my hoe down and cut across the side yard to get you the shade moved so by the time i got back the sun was shining right on you right in your face but you wasn't woke at all still asleep i wanted to pick you up in my arms and i wanted to look at you sleeping too didn't know which you had the sweetest face yonder not far was a grape arbor mr garner made always full of big plans he wanted to make his own wine to get drunk off never did get more than a kettle of jelly from it 
I don't think the soil is right for grapes. Your daddy believed it was the rain, not the soil. Six O said it was the bugs. The grapes so little and tight, sour as vinegar too, but there was a little table in there. So I picked up your basket and carried you over to the grape arbor. Cool in there and shady, I set you down on the little table and figured if I got a piece of muesling, the bugs and things wouldn't get to you. And if Mrs. Garner didn't need me right there in the kitchen, I could get a chair and you and me could sit out there while I did the vegetables. I headed for the back door to get the clean muesling we kept in the kitchen press. The grass felt good on my feet. I got near the door and I heard voices. School teacher made his pupils sit and learn books for a spell every afternoon. If it was nice enough weather, they'd sit on the side porch, all three of them. He'd talk and they'd write or he would read and they would write down what he said. I never told nobody this. Not your pap, not nobody. I almost told Mrs. Garner, but she was so weak then and getting weaker. This is the first time I'm telling it and I'm telling it to you. Because I might help explain something to you, although I know you don't need me to do it. To tell it or even think over it. You don't have to listen either if you don't want to. But I couldn't help listening to what I heard that day. He was talking to his pupils and I heard him say, Which one are you doing? And one of the boys said, Sethi. That's when I stopped because I heard my name. And then I took a few steps to where I could see what they was doing. School teacher was standing over one of them with one hand behind his back. He licked the forefinger a couple of times and turned a few pages slow. I was about to turn around and keep on my way to where the muesling was when I heard him say, No, no, that's not the way. I told you to put her human characteristics on the left, her animal ones on the right, and don't forget to line them up. I commenced to walk backward, didn't even look behind me to find out where I was headed. I just kept lifting my feet and pushing back. When I bumped up against the tree, my scalp was prickly. One of the dogs was licking out a pan in the yard. I got to the grape arbor fast enough, but I didn't have the muesling. Flies settled all over your face, rubbing their hands. My head itched like the devil, like somebody was sticking fine needles in my scalp. I never told Hale or nobody, but that very day I asked Mrs. Garner a part of it. She was low then. Not as low as she ended up, but failing. A kind of bag grew under her jaw. It didn't seem to hurt her, but it made her weak. First she'd be up and spry in the morning, and by the second milking, she couldn't stand up. Next she took to sleeping late. The day I went up there, she was in bed the whole day. And I thought to carry her some bean soup and ask her then when I opened the bedroom door, she looked at me from underneath her nightcap. Already it was hard to catch life in her eyes. Her shoes and stockings were on the floor, so I knew she had tried to get dressed. I brung you some bean soup, I said. She said, I don't think I can swallow that. Try a bit, I told her. Too thick. I'm sure it's too thick. Want me to loosen it up with a little water? No, take it away. Bring me some cool water, that's all. Yes, ma'am. Ma'am, could I ask you something? What is it, Sethi? What do characteristics mean? What? A word, characteristics. Oh, she moved her head around on the pillow. Features, who taught you that? I heard the school teacher say it. Change the water, Sethi. This is warm. Yes, ma'am. Features, water, Sethi. Cool water. I put... I put the pitcher on the tray with the white bean soup and went downstairs. When I got back with the fresh water, I held her head while she drank. It took her a little while because that lump made it hard to swallow. She laid back and wiped her mouth. The drinking seemed to satisfy her, but she frowned and said, I don't seem to be able to wake up, said the All I seem to is want to sleep. All I seem to is want is sleep. I don't seem able to wake up, said the All I seem to want is sleep. Then do it, I told her. I'm take care of things. Then she went on, what about this, what about that? Said she knew Hale was no trouble, but she wanted to know if school teacher was handling the Pauls all right. And six o. yes ma'am, I said, look like it. Do they, do they do what he tells them? They don't need telling. Good, that's a mercy. I should be back downstairs in a day or two. I just need more rest. Doctors do back, tomorrow, is it? You said features, ma'am. What? Features. Um, like a feature of summer is heat. A characteristic is a feature, a thing that's natural to a thing. Can you have more than one? You can have quite a few, you know. Say a baby sucks his thumb. That's one, but it has others too. Keep Billy away from Red Coda. Mr. Garner never let her calf every other year. Seth, do you hear me? Come away from that window and listen. Yes, ma'am. Ask my brother-in-law to come up after supper. Yes, ma'am. If, you if, you if you'd wash your hair, you could get rid of that lice. Ain't no lice in my head, ma'am. Whatever it is, a good scrubbing is what it needs, not scratching. Don't tell me we're out of soap. No, ma'am. All right, now, I'm through. Talking makes me tired. Yes, ma'am. And thank you, Sethi. Yes, ma'am. You was too little to remember the quarters. Your brother slept under the window. Me, you, and your daddy slept by the wall. The night after I heard why school teacher measured me, I had trouble sleeping. When Hale came in, I asked him what he thought about school teacher. He said there wasn't nothing to think about. Said he's white, ain't he? I said, but I mean, is he like Mr. Garner? 
What you want to know, Sethi? Him and her, I said, they ain't like the whites I seen before, the ones in the big place I was before I came here. How's these different, he asked me. Well, I said, they talk soft for one thing. It don't matter, Sethi. What they say is the same, loud or soft. Mr. Garner let you buy out your mother, I said. Yup, he did. Well, if he had enough, she would have dropped in his cooking stove. Still, he did it. Let you work it off. Uh-huh. Wake up, Hale. I said, uh-huh. He could have said no. He didn't tell you no. No, he didn't tell me no. She worked here for 10 years. If she worked another 10, you think she would have made it out? I pay him for her last years, and in return, he got you, me, and three more coming up. I got one more year of debt work, one more. A school teacher in there told me to quit it. Said the reason for doing it don't hold. I should do the extra, but here, at Sweet Home. Is he going to pay you for the extra? Nope. Then how are you going to pay it off? How much is it? $123.70. Don't he want it back? He wants something. What? I don't know. Something, but he don't want me off Sweet Home no more. Say he don't pay to have my labor somewhere else while the boys is small. What about the money you owe? He must have another way of getting it. What way? I don't know, Sethi. Then the only question is how. How are we going to get it? No, that's one question. There's no, there's one more. What's that? He leaned up and turned over, touching my cheek with his knuckles. The question now is, who's going to buy you out? Or me? Or her? He pointed over to where you was laying. What? If all my labor is sweet home, including the extra, what I got left to sell? He, turn, he turned over then and went back to sleep, and I thought I wouldn't, but I did too for a while. Something he said, maybe, or something he didn't say woke me. I sat up like somebody hit me, and you woke up too and commenced to cry. I rocked you some, but there wasn't much room, so I stepped outside the door to walk you. Up and down, I went up and down, everything dark but lamplight in the top window of the house. She must have been up still. I couldn't get out of my head the thing that woke me up. While the boys is small, that's what he said, and it snapped me awake. They tagged after me the whole day, weeding, milking, getting firewood. For now, for now. That's when we should have begun to plan, but we didn't. I don't know what we thought, but getting away was a money thing to us. Buy out. Running was nowhere on our minds. All of us? Some? Where to? How to go? It was Sixel who brought it up. Finally, after Paul F. Mrs. Garner sold him, trying to keep things up. Already she lived two years off his price. But it ran out, I guess, so she wrote school teacher to come take over. For a sweet home man, and she still believed she needed her brother-in-law and two boys, because people said she shouldn't be alone out there with nothing but Negroes. So he came with a big hat and spectacles and a coach box full of paper. Talking soft and watching hard, he beat Paul A. Not hard and not long, but it was the first time anyone had because Mr. Garner disallowed it. Next time I saw him, he had company in the prettiest trees he ever saw. Sixo started watching the sky. He was the only one who crept that night, and Hale said, that's how we learned about the train. That way, Hale was pointing over the stable where he took my ma'am. Sixo said freedom is that way. A whole train is going, and if we can get there, don't need to be no buyout. Train? What's that? I asked him. They stopped talking in front of me then, even Hale, but they whispered among themselves and Sixo watched the sky. Not the high part, the low part where it touched the trees. You could tell his mind was gone from Sweet Home. The plan was a good one, but when it came time, I was big with Denver, so we changed it a little. A little, just enough to butter Hale's face, so Paul D. tells me and makes Sixo laugh at last. But I got you out, baby, and the boys too. When the signal for the train come, you all was the only ones ready. I couldn't find Hale or nobody. I didn't know Sixel was burned up and Paul D. dressed in a collar. You wouldn't believe. Not till later, so I sent you all to the wagon with the women who waited in the corn. Ha ha, no notebook for my babies and no measuring string neither. What I had to get through later, I got through because of you. Passed right by those boys hanging in the trees. One had Paul A.'s shirt on, but not his feet or his head. I walked right on. I walked right on by because only me had your milk. And God do what he would, I was going to get it to you. You remember that, don't you, that I did? That when I got here, I had milk enough for all? One more curve in the road and Sethi could see her chimney. It wasn't lonely looking anymore. The ribbon of smoke was from a fire that warmed a body returned to her, just like it never went away, never needed a headstone. And the heart that beat inside it had not for a single moment stopped in her hands. She opened the door, walked in, and locked it tight behind her. The day Stamp Pate saw the two backs through the window and then hurried down the steps, he believed the undecipherable language clamoring around the house was the mumbling of the black and angry dead. Very few had died in bed like Baby Suggs and none that he knew of, including Baby, had lived a livable life. Even the educated colored, the educated colored, the long school people, the doctors, the teachers, the paper writers and businessmen had a hard row to hoe. In addition to having to use their heads to get ahead, they had the weight of the whole race sitting there. You needed two heads for that. White people believed that whatever the manners under every dark skin was a jungle. 
swift unnavigable swift unnavigable waters swinging screaming baboons sleeping snakes red gums ready for the sweet white blood and the way he thought they were right the more colored people spent their strength trying to convince them how gentle they were how clever and loving how human the more they used themselves up to persuade whites of something negroes believe cannot be questioned the deeper and more tangled the jungle grew inside but it wasn't the jungle blacks brought with them to this place from the other livable place it was the jungle white folks planted in them and it grew it spread in through and after life it spread until it invaded the whites who had made it touched them every one changed and altered them made them bloody silly worse than even they wanted to be so scared were they of the jungle they had made the screaming baboon lived under their own white skin the red gums were their own Meantime, the secret spread of this new kind of white folks' jungle was hidden, silent, except once in a while, when you can hear its mumbling in places like 124. Stamp paid, abandoned his efforts to see about Sethi after the pain of knocking and not gaining entrance, and when he did, 124 was left to its own devices. When Sethi locked the door, the women inside were free at last to be what they liked, see whatever they saw, and say whatever was on their minds. Almost. Mixed in with the voices surrounding the house, recognizable but undecipherable to stamp paid, were the thoughts of the women of 124, unspeakable thoughts, unspoken.